Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, firstly, can I say um, thank you? Um, very, very pleased to be here um, to, um, to talk to you and, and, and to meet you. Um, my wife, uh, Heidi, and I have decided to take uh, five days of holiday, and we're going to spend some time in the area uh, with local guides um, and local, local tourism businesses. Um, but I want to say that um, the reason we're doing that is not to see the nature and the culture um, in the area. Um, you should be very, very proud of your nature and culture. But every country in the world has remarkable nature and wildlife. And the reason I'm taking five days holiday to stay um, is because I think we have the opportunity to see your nature and culture in an authentic way. And that's why I want to take a holiday. It's authenticity that really, really matters to me. Um, and that's a theme that I'd like to come back to um, in, this, um, in this talk. And lastly, there was a very authentic experience with you um, last night. Uh, I am a, a tourism entrepreneur. Um, I'm a businessman. Um, and I think um, most good businessmen have a mentor, a business hero, if you like. Um, this is my business hero. This is Anita Roddick, who, who founded The Body Shop. And The Body Shop, fabulously successful business, a billion dollars worth of sales, hair care and toiletries. I know it has a franchise in, in Finland. It started with one small shop um, in the UK. Anita is a remarkably successful business person. But she also had a remarkably different view of business. Business typically is viewed as something that makes profit. That's what business does. Government and charities create positive change. Anita's view, going back 30 years, was that business has to be a force for good too. Um, business had to make profits, but it also had to be a positive agent for change. And I think 30 years on um, in the world, looking at that now, that's increasing expectations of business. In fact, Henry Ford, founder of the Ford Motor Company, uh, he said, business must be run at a profit or else it will die. But if business is only run for profit, it will also die. It will also surely die because it has no reason to exist. So perhaps Henry Ford was one of the earlier thinkers uh, along those lines. The business that I founded 11 years ago now, after working with Anita Roddick at the Body Shop, she inspired me as an entrepreneur to go out and form a business which made profits but also created real positive change. And the business I founded is called ResponsibleTravel.com. We're a type of online travel agent. We market holidays from about 350 small specialist tour operators, like some of you guys in the room, from about 2,000 accommodations around the world all of whom are screened for criteria against responsible tourism. And our belief was that all of those businesses could be more successful if they were marketed from one common platform rather than struggling independently. If you like, we wanted to try and create the organic food movement in tourism by bringing together many small suppliers in one place. The business started very, very small, but it's become increasingly successful. We've sold about $100 million worth of holidays through the site. We have about 350,000 monthly visitors and a database of getting close to 200,000 uh, tourists who we mail each week uh, with news and offers and deals. We also have a US business called ResponsibleVacation.com. We were the first business of our type to do this as an aggregator of small specialist tourism businesses. And we're still by far and away the largest in our sector anywhere in the world. We market holidays in 140 countries around the world, but you'll be pleased to see that one place which is on the map um, is this place. Uh, we call it on the site Wild Tiger. Uh, we have 24 different products that are marketed through the site. And the reason for this is there was a partnership between uh, my business, ResponsibleTravel.com, and Visit Finland going back about two years when we started to identify the products and bring them to market. And I looked at the data just before just before flying out. And I was quite surprised to see the volume of booking inquiries. We've done about 510 booking inquiries over the past two years to these 24 products that are on the site. So marketed in the right way, 
through the right distribution channels, as you well know, your product has a real international uh, demand, has a real place in the market. We also run another site. It's called Our Land. Um, and it's a partnership between the national parks in southern England and my business, ResponsibleTravel.com. So the national parks decided that they wanted to develop tourism for sustainability. They wanted to screen it and they wanted to market it from one common platform, all of the national parks together. And they decided to appoint a private sector partner to that, which is unusual. And the reason they did that is what they didn't want to happen was for uh, a project to fail once the funding ran out. So developing it with us as a private sector partner means that I guarantee, contractually, I guarantee to sustain the site beyond the end of the funded period. I'd like to talk a little bit about my take on how responsible tourism sits in the marketplace. Marketing and distribution, that's going to be the subject of my talk. Um, but to do that, I want to talk a little bit about what responsible tourism is and the history of responsible tourism. I'll do this quite briefly, but if we go back to the 1970s, this is a real brochure. <laughs> this is a company who decided the best thing that they could tell their tourists was, when we ruin this place, we will just move on and we'll ruin somewhere else. <laughs> And that was acceptable. Uh, this cycle of destruction, uh, of discovering, developing, exploiting, and moving on, um, uh, was endemic. It, essentially, tourism refused to accept responsibility for its impacts. We then moved to the early ecotourism, maybe 35 years ago, born out of wildlife tourism, with this famous mantra of kill nothing but time, leave nothing but pictures, or leave nothing but footprints. Now this statement made a lot of people deeply angry. Well, and why would it do that? And who were those people? Well, those people were local communities around the world. Local communities who lived in the face of tourism. And for them, the impact of tourism, as Sue had, had, had spoken about, was not just on wildlife and environments, but on local people their cultures and their ways of life. They often face an opportunity cost of not using that area that's been set aside for tourism, not using it. They face that cost and they need some form of compensation for it. So maximizing the local economic benefit of tourism is critically important for its sustainability. Lord Marshall, who was the chairman of British Airways, put it a slightly different way, he said, listen, what we do in travel and tourism is essentially rent out, for short-term let, other people's environments, their homes, their coastlines, their cities or their mountain ranges. And we must never forget that. So for me, responsible tourism is essentially about authentic tourism experiences that create better places to live in and better places to visit. And it's really important, the order of those words. Better places to live in, first and foremost, as well as better places to visit. And of course, remember the triangles, that, that uh, the, the circles that Sue talked about. I'm talking about culture, I'm talking about environment, I'm talking about economics. And I think, you know, in, in many places around the world, including here, there are conflicts uh, between different uh, uh, industries, uh, and different e economic uses of land. And they'll always exist. But the one way to win those arguments is if you can maximize the local economic benefits, if you can demonstrate you're creating better places to live in, then you as a tourism entrepreneur, as a tourism business, or as a tourism destination, start to win those arguments. I'd like to come back to this word authentic, uh, because as we go, I'm a, a marketing guy, and that means a lot to me. Why is responsible tourism authentic? What is the link between responsibility and authenticity? And I think that when responsible tourism, at its best, is really well designed, it's because it's co-created. <coughs> it's co-created between the tourism business and partnership with local government. It's built around local knowledge, rituals, wisdom. It's built around dance and art and local guides and wildlife and nature and ways of life, local food, local service providers. When you do that, when you co-create tourism in a conversation, you 
with local communities and ways of life and build it properly with support for conservation of cultural and natural heritage, you get something which is magic and you get authenticity. And that is what really sells. Authenticity is a diff difficult word because for some people they may say McDonald's is an authentic eating experience for them. It's not for me, but authenticity is very much in the eye of the beholder. But to me, authenticity is about this. It's about a truthfulness, an honesty. It's about being real and it's about being genuine. Of course, tourism has a nasty habit of being anything but authentic. We look at the opposite to authenticity. We look at how tourism quite often packages up culture and nature. It fakes it up. It Disneyfies it. It coca colonizes it. It makes it something that it never was before and sells it to the tourist. And I think it often demeans the tourist and I think it often demeans local people as well. And when that happens, sometimes that culture and those ways of life are lost forever. Their true meaning is lost as it's commodified for tourism. And this, if your destination managers remember this, once you start to imagine what tourists would like you to be like, you've lost. You've lost the argument. You've lost the sense of who you are and what makes you different. So keep true to yourself. Keep it real, I guess I would say. How important is responsibility or sustainability in tourist decision-making process? Well, there's no research that's ever been published that's ever found that the social and environmental criteria of sustainability is the most important decision-making factor in tourist booking the whole day. It is always about the right product at the right price. And every week, I'm approached by a failed green tourism business that's misunderstood that, that's thought just because it started its business with very green philosophies means it will be successful. It will not. Uh, it absolutely needs to have um, a real product difference and really leave with a very strong experience if it's going to. So don't confuse the way in which we design <coughs> holidays, which is about responsibility, with the magic that that produces that we sell to tourists. What we sell to tourists is authenticity and experiences. But my belief is that you can't be truly authentic without having a level of responsibility. So responsibility is how we design it, what we sell is authenticity um, and the experiences which attract the tourists. Quickly look at some marketing trends. Uh, firstly, I'd like to talk about the tourist. Um, these guys are critically important. First thing is they've got the wallet. They've got the euros. And that is what it all is based upon. Um, they also have a very large thumbprint. I'd like to talk about that. The impacts of tourism, when some people plan tourism, they focus all of their efforts and sustainability on the transport and the accommodation providers. And that's not a bad place to start. But the impacts of tourism lie largely with the tourists. So you can take the most perfect eco lodge in the world, the tourist leaves the tap running and the water running all day, put the aircon on full power. If they go out and they cause problems in the local community, you have not created anything which is sustainable. So you might have a sustainable accommodation, but it's not a sustainable experience. So it's the tourist choices and actions which really relate strongly to sustainability. And if we don't in inspire the tourists and take the tourists with us, we can't control the impacts of tourism. But worse than that, um, we also can't create any local economic benefit if we're not really driving the tourists to, to spend locally in the local community. We also can't fund the development of responsible tourism. So I guess I'm making a case, maybe it doesn't need to be made, uh, for the market and the importance of the market. Um, sustainability, in the end, depends on that local economic benefit and the tourists behaving in a certain way. Talk about some things that are changing. Now, the first thing that's changing is tourism. It's, it is just growing enormously. These figures are now a little bit out of date. But the tourism industry is doubling between 2003 and 2020. Uh, and this is in a world of finite resources. We must 
remember how fast our industry has grown since its early days in the 50s and 60s, how enormous it's been now, and look at the acceleration of the growth. And notwithstanding the recession, I believe that that will continue. But we're seeing a generation of travellers who are different to generations before. Um, travellers now um, are using their time abroad to test goals that are emotional, that are physical, that are adventure driven, more than just ticking off lists of things to see and do. So maybe I've seen a bear, I've seen a wolf, is okay, I've ticked them off the list, but I think what people want is something which is a, a spiritual and an emotional experience, it's something which is bigger. What's also changing is that the tourism industry is fragmenting. There's more and more niches that are emerging. If you take in the UK, the packaged tourism industry, it used to have about 80% share of the market. It's now down to about 30% share of the market. What's taken that? Two things. Do-it-yourself travel, which we heard about earlier, but also these niches. Individually, these niches are small, but collectively, they're really big and increasingly big. In fact, I would go so far as to say that um, the niches are becoming the new mainstream. If you put the niches together, they are becoming the new mainstream. Experience for money um, is becoming as or more important than value for money. Um, we're also seeing experience inflation. <coughs> the tourist who was happy going to Spain 20 years ago now wants to go to Costa Rica. Um, each year, the experience that tourists expect and demand is increasing. And you need to understand that too. And I'm sure you've seen that with tourists coming um, to, your, to your destination. We live in the experience economy. The Harvard famously published a book on experience economy. Um, and the tourism industry and, and, and what you do here is perfect for the experience economy. a word on, on recession, but not on recession directly, but on the cultural changes that we're seeing as a result of, of recession. When you get a big economic shock, you get a big cultural shock, you get a big reaction to that. And this writer, Robert Fun, I think put it best, he likened it to the post-Second post, post -Second World War atmosphere of selective austerity. Before the recession, we could afford and we deserve, we would have everything, we would have it now. That's all changed. We now pick and choose which parts of our life we can afford to indulge ourselves in. And we, have, uh, we cut down on our costs in other areas. Whereas we used to take three holidays a year, four holidays a year, now we feel we need to earn that. We earn that pleasure. But what's also coming through is this yearning for connection and contact, something more real, and something more true uh, to places and, and, and people. All of which I think is, is actually good for responsible tourism. What's also a big trend um, is what I would call the backstory of products. The backstory is how a product was made, by whom, or under what conditions. And if you look at the food uh, marketers and the food advertisers, on the front of the front of the bottle, you will see the uh, the story of the product. On the back, you will see a picture of the farmer and how they produce that food. What's happening is they're seeking to reconnect people who make things and grow things with people who buy things. And that link has been lost in global trade. And they do it very, very well. This is in New York, um, Whole Foods. But if you look at most of the British supermarkets, in their best spaces behind the tills, they will put the stories of their food producers. Their best marketing place is the story of the food producers. So, for us in tourism, we must tell the stories of the guides. The guides and the community and the, and the local food and the produce must be the heroes of our marketing. We can learn from the food industry in that way. So, in summary, responsible tourism, for me, produces a more authentic and deeper experience. There's a very strong backstory as to how that tourism was developed and produced. It produces that connection and contact which is required. So I think responsible tourism um, will 
grow very strongly in the marketplace. My business is currently between 40 and 50 percent up year on year. And the reason it's up is because of the authenticity and the storytelling around the suppliers. On, um, on our site, we give people the, the choice as to how to uh, search for their holiday. They can choose uh, either by activity or by destination. The majority choose by activity, not by destination. So they would choose wildlife first, and then they would start to look around the world for wildlife experiences. Now, that is a really critical realization because it means you're in a truly global marketplace. On our site, as in, as in sites in the, in the US and in, elsewhere in Europe, the tourist is thinking about wildlife and wondering whether to go to Alaska, whether to go to China, whether to go to Scotland, uh, Madagascar, or India. That's what's in their decision-making uh, process and in their thinking. So it raises an interesting question for you here. Who is your competition? Are you competing against a, a local wildlife operator who's 10 kilometers away? Are you competing against a region which is 20 kilometers away? Or, or are you in fact competing against Scotland, China, uh, Peru, Kenya, and Tanzania? And if you buy the argument that to an extent, you are competing globally as well as amongst yourselves, then it means that your businesses here must collaborate if they are to succeed. If you are to build a destination brand, a wild tiger brand if you like, you have to collaborate. And it's very difficult, and I've seen this in many destinations around the world. I've seen an operator here, sat next to an operator there, and these guys in their minds believe that the biggest competitor is each other. I'm marketing their holidays in the UK and I can tell them those guys are not competing. What they're really competing against is the Carpathian Mountains in Romania or wildlife experience in, in Spain. It's a very difficult concept to understand but it's very important to, to understand and define who you really are competing against. If you do decide to collaborate then some things are important. And I can see this beginning to emerge uh, uh, quite powerfully, I think, although at early stages through the Wild Tiger organization. I can see you helping British and American tourists link up products. The Finnish tourists will, will, will organize themselves around your area. The British tourists and American tourists won't. They need one central booking point, and they want the hard work done about linking up these experiences. I can see that being happening. Also, from what I understand here, there's 35 different wildlife businesses, small-scale businesses. <coughs> if each of those businesses had access to fantastic information, branding, photography, video, which they use consistently to promote this area, then individually you're small, but collectively you're quite big. And that would be required in order to feel a strong destination brand. So in the future, we all know of famous, for example, South African game parks. They become destinations in their own right. Your aim here has to be, over time, to build yourself as a wildlife destination in your own right. So it's the first choice that people make. How many uh, tourism businesses are there here? How many entrepreneurs are there? There's a small die-hard group. Um, <laughs> There's two things to get really, to, in my view, to get really, really good at. Uh, your marketing budgets are probably really, really small. In the grand scheme of things, they're infinitesimal. But you're rich in one thing. You are rich in stories. And if you develop your storytelling, you can outcompete a big corporate business. You will beat them on storytelling every single day of the week. And of course, what the internet does is nothing more than allow your stories to be found quicker and more widely than ever before. So for a small, passionate business, keep it personal. Make your face on the front of the picture. I, you know, I warm to you. I want to book with you. You're not a big corporate. Don't play their game. Show me your face. Show me your guides. And make it personal. In 
terms of in terms of internet marketing, just a little thing, you know, this shouldn't be my business here. My business lists number one on Google for Wild Tiger. Tiger holidays. But bear watching holidays worldwide on Google. Google, I'm here. Uh, bear watching holidays in Finland, I'm number one. You should be beating me at that. You should be beating me at that. But you've got to work at it. Um, otherwise, I'm going to make all the commission by selling your products. Um, but you can get better at that. Um, just, just finally now, just, just my last thing. Um, you know, speaking perhaps to the tourism entrepreneurs here, just, just for a moment. I think what you're doing is incredible. It's, it's really remarkable because what you're trying to do is you're trying to build your own businesses, but you've also put a lot of time and effort into building the case for conservation. And you know, my hat is off to you. I think that's fantastic work. And I know there's strong vested interest here in, in hunting and reindeer, and there should be. I know you're the new kids on the block, but I just admire what you've done. I think it's really fantastic. Kitos. Thank you, Justin. Uh, Uh, you have this cooperation with the uh, national parks in uh, South England. Yes. Is there any uh, ideas or plans to have wider cooperation so that you could have uh, some Scottish parks or, or other parts of the Britain parks? Um, I would love to. I'd love to. Um, I, I think the idea um, increasingly that, that, um, that government bodies, conservation bodies, partly with the private sector marketeers, whilst new and a little bit difficult, uh, I, I think that will grow. Um, because I think, I, don't, I think governments are finding it difficult to justify marketing of tourism when the private sector can do it very, very well. Um, but in my case, they've given me a public sub subsidy, it's EU money, for three years. They say, here's some money to establish this, and then sign this contract to take it over and run it. Uh, afterwards with no subsidy. But what it means is, is that it's sustainable. In 10 years time I'll still be marketing for them tourism in their national parks. Um, and I'd love to do that more one year. Tell us something about the supplier screening and yes. selection criteria. Yes. Um, we require um, certain things of businesses, which I'll describe. But we also make the tourist part of the feedback loop. And you've described how, I've described how I think the tourist, how they act and how they behave is a big part of the impact. So we ask every tour operator to have a, a policy for responsible tourism before we will accept them, and we have minimum criteria for that. But then for every single trip that they put onto the site, they write on the page, after the itinerary and the pricing, they write what they're doing, how they're implementing that policy for that particular trip. And we don't provide a long chest checklist of criteria. Uh, we used to provide a big long checklist. And what I've increasingly realized is the impacts of tourism are different every, every, everywhere in the world. Some places water conservation is a big issue, in others it's not. In some cases poverty reduction is a big issue, in other cases it's not at all. So we ask the business to say, what are the issues locally and what are we doing to address them? The tourist reads that as they book their holiday. We then, as we publish, or we see them publish tourist reviews, we ask them what was the most amazing thing about their holiday, what tips would they give the tourist, another tourist, but also what did they think about the social environmental impacts of the holiday. We publish that too on the page and the tour operator has a right to reply uh, if it's critical. So the tourist is in the process of feeding back. Every tourist who's booking is reading uh, the policies, is feeding back on their experience and on the social environmental impacts and that every single one of those reviews is being sent back to the tour operator and published on the site. So it's a, it's a consumer-driven form of checks and measures. And if the tour company is found to have misrepresented, have lied about their practices, 
then we have a process that is three strikes in your um, in your app. So it's it's different to certification. Certification doesn't involve the tourist. This this does. And that's probably also the co-creation you talked about. Yes. Earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How big impact does social media have on your business? Um, well, I, I, I think that um, we too are rich in stories. Um, social media is still a small part of our business. It's, it's about 1% of our booking enterprise, so it's small. Um, but I, you know, I think two or three years time, that'll be, that'll be five, five, ten percent But the, the bedrock of our business is search engine optimization, pay-per-click advertising on Google, very, very profitable, a big database. Um, that's the core of it. So with social media, gravitate towards it, invest your time in it, but do it proportionally. You really need to understand how, how, how big it is. So uh, we're trying to rein back our excitement. We would like to spend more time, but it's still small.